it's your season. Praise the Lord. It's your season to be blessed. It's Throwback Sunday today, and we just thank God for uh, his promise that it is our season. We'll be fruitful in every season is yeah. what the Lord actually promises us. So every season is your season. Uh, I, I see in uh, Isaiah, I believe it's uh, chapter 61, it says that we can declare our year of jubilee. Yeah. Right? We can declare the acceptable year of the Lord. So we don't have to wait every 50 years. Uh, we can declare this is my jubilee year. This is my year of blessing. And <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank God for all of you that have come out. Uh, we thank you for those that are joining us later uh, on, on YouTube, and we just bless you. God is doing great things, uh, doesn't, uh, I know we can find excuses and reasons to complain and, and hold our heads down, but God <coughs> is doing great, great things for us, whereof we are glad. Amen. 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 Uh, let us turn in our Bibles today. Uh, we're going to start off talking by, about a very familiar uh, story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, you all know the story of David and Goliath. Uh, much of the world knows the story of David and Goliath. Uh, we all know about the little guy going against the giant guy. Uh, it's a familiar theme uh, in stories, movies, etc. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. And as you're finding out, let's just have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. God, we thank you for those who could have, like others, uh, rolled yeah, over in bed yeah. and said, you know, it's just a good sleeping day. But they chose to come out. And God, for those that made the extra effort to come out and to worship you, God, I pray a special blessing, a special anointing be upon them today. O oh God, for their desire to hear your word, O oh God, in Jesus' name. God, I pray that this that this word be a source of encouragement, inspiration, and blessing yeah. to everyone that it hears. Till the soil of our heart that we might recept, be receptive to this good seed that would spring forth and be productive in our lives. God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 1 Samuel 17, verse 28 through 31, we'll read. And Eliab, if you can say it better than me, you can. Eliab, uh, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thou the naughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. We're going to stop there. So, uh, just to do a little bit of the backstory, uh, Israel had just not too long before gotten their first king, King Saul, and Saul was messing up a bit. So, uh, God told Samuel, the the prophet of the day, uh, to go and anoint a new king. He went down to Jesse's house and. Uh, he went through all of his sons, and, and he said, you know, God says, it's none of these guys. Do you have any more sons? He said, well, I got one other kid who's out there uh, tending the sheep. He said, well, bring him in here. And he said, yes, this is the one that God has chosen to anoint, uh, to be the king of Israel. And so Samuel anointed David uh, while Saul was still king. He anointed David, this young man, young boy. Some say he could have been as young as 14, but probably around the age of 17 years old, anointed king of, of uh, all of Israel. And so uh, that takes place, and David's uh, dad says, okay, man, get back out there to tend to those sheep, and David goes out and tends the sheep, as, almost as if nothing had ever happened. But all the while, ever since uh, the real 
was since the children of Israel took possession of the land of Canaan, they were harassed by these guys known as the Philistines. Yes, yes. Now, recent archaeologists have discovered that the Philistines were originally Greek sailors, probably from Crete, who just harassed people all over the Mediterranean. And they just decided to land and take up home in what is now uh, the, the coast of Israel or the Gaza Strip. And they just constantly harassed the, the children of Israel. Uh, and you can see that in the preceding chapters leading up to this. But now in this case, uh, they said, you know what, it doesn't make sense for our armies to just keep fighting. Uh, we'll send out a champion and you send out your champion and we'll let them settle the deal. Yes, yes. And, and then the, the one will be the slaves of the other. Mm -hmm. So David, who was anointed king, went out and served a few sheep. But then while this a challenge was going on, all his brothers were older and they went off, they had been made soldiers, you know, they went through all the training and now they're in this war camp. And uh, Saul and the army of the Lord, the army of Israel is trembling in his boots, in their boots, because the champion of the Philistines, you know, you can read all about it, he's nine feet tall and he said his, his spear is like a beam. And they go on and say how much all of his armor weighs and all of this and all of that. And so uh, David, who was anointed king, his dad calls him off his seemingly menial job of tending a few sheep and says, okay, now I'm going to give you a job with Uber Eats or DoorDash, <laughs> and I'm going to send you off with some cheese sandwiches to go to your brothers. The king. I had something completely different arranged for uh, men's Day um, for both of us. I mean, all three of us. Uh, but, uh, it got changed up a little bit last night. So we'll just still call it uh, Men's Message. So God, uh, uh, David's dad, turn, sends him out to, to go uh, send these sandwiches, you know, DoorDash. He takes his sandwiches to his brothers who were fighting soldiers in the wars. And uh, his oldest brother gets upset. David, what are you doing here? Why are you hanging around? Get out of here. Go back. You did what you're supposed to do. Now go back. Uh, and he said, who's watching those little bit of sheep that you have, that we have? And if you read a few verses before, he said, you know, I left the keeper with them. He didn't say this in the passage that we read, but he said he set a keeper before him. He, he came down in a wagon and he left the keeper with the wagon. And I said, David, I don't know where you get those keepers, but I need a couple of those keepers uh, uh, with us. But he says to his brothers, he said, is there not a cause? And that's what I want to ask you today, and that's what I want to talk about today. Is there not a cause? He said, are we here at war for nothing? Why are we sitting around facing the enemy face to face, listening to this, this doofus uh, yell taunts at us? Isn't there a reason for righteous indignation? Shouldn't we be up in arms? Should we just be sitting around when the devil is taunting and mocking us and making fun of us? Are we not well able to take on this challenge? A couple years ago, as I was praying, uh, asking the Lord, you know, what is the strategy? What, what should I be doing? You know, because I'm feeling what David's feeling uh, is there no cause? Is, isn't there a reason that I should be doing something? Shouldn't I be doing more than sitting on a church pew Sunday after Sunday waiting for the rapture? Oh, it's just getting so horrible out of here. Take me away, Calgon. <laughs> so I'm praying, and, I'm, and I, at the end of my prayer, I'm saying, Lord, do I go into like a defensive mode or do I go on an offensive mode? Because, you know, we, we shouldn't go rushing, chasing devils everywhere uh, because we might get out of our territory. So I said, God, am I defensive? So am, I, am I to hold ground or am I to go out and take ground? And I, just as I was uh, finishing up, not ex really even expecting an answer to that question, I said, you're neither in defensive mode nor in offensive mode, but you're in crisis mode. Mm -hmm. And I was confused. I said, God, do the people of God get in crisis mode? What do you mean crisis mode? So I looked up what the word crisis meant, 
And it meant the point of inflection, the point where the outcome is determined. And if I look, I, I, so, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a history buff, and I thought about all the wars, and I thought about the Revolutionary War. You know, uh, you can go through a war and lose a battle or two, but it gets to a point, if you lose enough battles, if you lose one more battle, you, the whole war is in jeopardy. You know, when we started the Revolutionary War, uh, the, the, the colonists had a great victory in Boston, yay! The British came down and attacked Long Island, and, lo and we lost to the British in Long Island. Then they attacked Harlem. We lost in Harlem. Uh, then they started sweeping down through New Jersey, and we had a, a small victory in Princeton, but they came on down, and we lost in Fort Washington. And, and then we lost in Germantown. And then uh, they kept on coming down south, and we were losing all these battles. And it got to a point at Yorktown in Virginia, said, if we lose this one, it's lost for us. There's no hope. But that's where the great turnaround. We had a great victory in Yorktown. And uh, shortly after that, a few months after that victory, that was the inflection point. That was the crisis point. We've got to do whatever we've got to do. We've got to call on the, the, the God of heaven to, to help us and to give us wisdom and to give us strategies. And they won at Yorktown, which caused them ultimately, it decided the end of the war. I thought about the uh, uh, Civil War, how the North was just getting beat up all the time. They thought, you know, we have a great advantage. We have all the wealth, we have all the railways, we have all this, that, and the other thing. Uh, there's no way we could lose to the poor South. But they were getting their butts whipped. Can I say butt? <laughs> Church? <laughs> well, they were getting their hind ends handed to them by the South. Time after time, and, and the North was having a problem finding a decent general. The South had a great general in Robert E. Lee, and, and finally they found Ulysses S. Grant, and, and we come to Gettysburg, and that was a, a pivotal point here in Pennsylvania, not far from our nation's capital, in Gettysburg. Things turned around then. That was a pivotal point where nearly 100,000 people died on that battle, including North and South. And, 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 and Abraham Lincoln gives that great speech, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth this, this continent a new nation, et cetera. You know the rest, I don't have to say it for you. And that turn, that determined the North victory. In World War II in the European uh, 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 theater, there was what's called the Normandy invasion where the generals of the world came together with uh, General Eisenhower. They determined that if we just overwhelm the Germans at one strategic point, if we forget about the Pacific for right now, we just overwhelm them at one point. If we throw enough bodies at them, we've got to overcome. And fortunately, they did win, but it was that great loss of life, 40,000 men and soldiers lost their lives on the beaches of Normandy, but that was a pivotal point in the war, and that's when the European uh, uh, part of the war turned. And they ultimately defeated the Germans and won in Europe. But now they said, now let's turn our attention on the Pacific theater. And they were losing to the Japanese. And island after island, the Japanese said we could, we could bomb Pearl Harbor because the United States could not manufacture enough ships fast enough to defeat us. They underestimated our nation and our God. Our nation, our people turned to God in prayer. The, the, I'm told that the churches were filled during World War II, people crying out, God, give us victory. And the book that we're reading in our book study on, of, uh, on Friday nights is Reese Howell's intercessor, and that was during the period of World War II, and he had a school where he taught the people, his children, people, uh, uh, to intercede. And as we get later into the book, we see how their prayers turned the war like a river. And they would read about the results of their prayers in the pages of the newspapers the, the very next day. 
And so in the South Pacific Theater, it got to the Battle of Midway. It was about halfway between Japan and the Hawaiian Islands. They call it the, the Island of Midway. They had a tremendous battle there. And the Allies won the battle. And that was a turning point in the war against the Axis powers, the Japanese. And ultimately, we won the war. Our nation at this point, we are in a crisis. We've seen defeats along the way as far as the Christians are concerned. We've seen defeats in the courts as far as Bible reading and prayer in the schools and then abortion. And then uh, we uh, lost uh, the Defense of Marriage Act and now anybody can marry anything at any time it seems like. And, and all kinds of perversions have swept into our nation and we cannot continue to lose these battles if we expect to win the war of this nation. We cannot sit down and say, I am saved. I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. But God said, I didn't save you to sit here. I saved you to save somebody else. Yeah. Is there not a cause that we should be motivated by? Yeah. Or is there not a cause when we turn on our TVs and see violence in our city? You know, it was so funny. I was talking to a pastor in South Carolina, and they had asked me to speak there. And I did, and I was talking about some of the things that we were doing in Philadelphia and, and how it is the job and the, the, the purpose of the church is to influence the community. Now, I'm not just talking. Now, there's a lot of social programs going in a lot of churches. There's a lot of churches giving out food. That's a wonderful thing. Everybody, as far as I've ever met, needs to eat. <laughs> there are churches that have clothing programs. That's wonderful. That's excellent. That's great. But is there anybody concerned about the spiritual man? Amen. Are there people crying out to God saying, God, save my city. God, save my neighbors. Not just so he'll stop throwing trash in my yard, but save him so that he doesn't have to experience a burning hell. Amen. Our nation is in crisis mode. Yes. And what we do here and now will determine whether we become a sheep or a goat nation. What does that mean? The sheep nations are the nations that are highly favored by God, and the goat nations are those that God has lifted his hand of protection from and has allowed the enemy to wreak havoc in the nation. We are beginning to see the enemy wreak havoc in our nation. We've got homosexual choirs probably uh, singing and declaring, we're coming for your children. We're going to take your children. We've got professors in universities that say the purpose of the university is to change the minds of the children from their fathers. Yeah, I, I saw a video just yesterday how a teacher in Utah was telling their students that you students are smarter than your parents. Your parents know nothing mm. because they believe there's a God and they dare to pray, pray to him. Your parents don't know anything because they believe there's only two genders. Well, you know what? Just yesterday, I went to a public restroom, and there was a male and a female. I said, don't, aren't we supposed to have like 108 different bathrooms for the 108 different genders? But I said, oh, man, I'm so stupid. Anybody can go to any bathroom. Jesus. It depends. what You can just declare what you are at the moment. Jesus. These are battles that the church is sitting idly by and saying, oh, we lost another one, but God, come quickly, come snatch me out. But the truth of the matter, God says he's not coming until the saints possess the kingdom. God said he's not coming in Acts chapter 3 until the restitution of all things. Restitution, if you're not aware, is different from restoration. Restitution means not only are you going to fix it like it was, but I, you got to pay more just because you made me mad. Just because you, you did that thing against me, I'm going to punish you on top of you restoring. If you stole my book, not only do you have to return my book, but you have to be fined and give me some cash along with it. That's what restitution, and that's what Acts chapter 3 says. He said, whom the heavens must retain until the restitution of all things. 
everything that the enemy has stolen from you must be returned to the people of God. Right. I'm getting ahead of myself. But not only everything that the enemy stole has, has to be returned, there has to be more than that added to it. We have to have more than we lost. That's restitution. That's what God says. Heaven is retaining Jesus Christ until the restitution of all things. Is there not a cause for us to cry out to the God of heaven? Yeah. God saved the land. God healed the land. Our nation is in crisis mode. I don't know if you've been watching TV, but uh, our nation has gone from energy independence to now, just recently, begging the Arabs, please, please, yeah. Mr. Arab man, yeah. produce more oil or we're going to face an economic situation that we had in the 70s where the folks are going to have to line up for gasoline and it's going to make me look bad. We, the, the leaders of the nation, it's going to make a, please, Mr. Oil people over there in Muslim land, help us Christians out. Just last week, you saw the United States military, supposedly the greatest military force on the face of the earth, abandoned $83 billion worth of weapons and vehicles, which is most of which is classified weaponry that the soldiers are told, if you can't take it with you, destroy it before you leave, has fallen into the Taliban's hand. Yeah. How is that possible? Jesus. Looks like the... Goat nation to me. God has withdrawn his hand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not only that, but we've betrayed the local and the regional people who have interpreted to us and, and supported the United States troops and have warned them of impending yeah. danger. Mm -hmm. Just abandoned them. Yeah. They betrayed the confidence of their allies that we've made and that we've agreed with these countries and said, we will protect you against any foreign invasion. And it didn't take long for China to sweep into Afghanistan and make a deal with them for all the titanium. They said a trillion dollars worth of titanium hidden in the hills of, of Afghanistan. It didn't take long for China to get on the television and say, OK, we, you see how uh, the United States does. We're going to take back Taiwan. You see, the instability of the United States of America caused the instability of the world. The instability of the United States is in, unstable because of the instability of the church. God says, if my people, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not the rich, not the poor, not the powerful, but if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways. He said, I'll hear you. And I'll heal the land. The land is sick. But government doesn't have the cure. The president doesn't have the cure. We, the people, have the cure. Hallelujah. Not only those foreign issues, but we have domestic issues, which are just too much to number here, just too much to go into right here. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Let's get back to David here. It was the oldest brother, Eliab, who spoke up. Why do I suppose it was him who spoke up? It's because he was the one who was most entrenched in tradition or things being as they are. He knew how things were supposed to happen. He knew how things traditionally went. He knew that David didn't go through boot camp. David didn't know anything about military dress, how to wear his armor. He didn't know anything about his weaponry. Mm -hmm. He didn't even take any strategic courses like we did. He didn't have to march with a backpack on his back uphill 10 miles. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to do any of that. Here he is just showing up, talking to everybody like he's going to do something. And so he's getting righteously indignant against him defending tradition. Listen, people of God, I know you've been in church a long time and you know how church is supposed to operate. But God said, I'm bringing in a new anointing. He said, so that you're not dependent on your traditions, you're not dependent on your own might, not by uh, might nor by power, but it's by my strength, by my power, says God. And over the past two days, I've been walking throughout the city 
with a group of intercessors who said they felt the need to come to Philadelphia, the birthplace of the nation, so that they could dig up some roots. I said, isn't that funny? Because I felt like my calling was to attack the root of sin rather than the fruit of sin. And I started a prayer and deliverance team. And I said, what we're going to do is different from what most churches and most people are doing. We're going to attack the roots of sin rather than the fruit. Most churches go to the old folks' homes, the nursing homes, the, 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 the halfway houses, the prisons, and they witness to the products of sin. There is nothing wrong. Please hear me. There is nothing wrong with that. I would love it if we had a prison ministry. I would love it to send missionaries to impoverished nations and to nursing homes and those that can't have readily have access to the gospel. That would be great. But I believe God has called me to pray, pray down the roots. What's causing people to turn away from God? What's causing people to rob, steal, and destroy? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? David was saying, can't you see that defeat is guaranteed in the valley of indecision or indifference? Can't you see that without a vision, the people perish? Well, what's vision? Vision is the act or power of anticipating that which will or may come into being. Yes. If we truly had watchmen on the walls, they would see in advance the things that are coming. Mm -hmm. Those that are in tune with God hear from heaven and say, no, no, people of God, we should not elect this one. You, listen, right. listen, don't, Amen. don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. Amen. I, I've said repeatedly already that there's no president, no mayor, no governor that's going to save us. There's no government program. The only thing they will do is make it easier or harder to fulfill the mission that God has assigned us. And that's why we need righteous people in office from the president down to the dog catcher. We need righteousness because it exalted the nation. It brings a nation up. We don't need folks in office that promote the homosexual lifestyle. God loves the homosexual. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God wants us to cry out and pray and intercede for the LGBTQ community. God wants them saved. God wants them in heaven as much as he wants you in heaven. Is there not a cause? Yes, we certainly have a cause. But God says we've got to have a vision. We've got to see. We've got to have a compassion for our neighbors and realize that they're on their way to hell unless somebody uh, tells them of the love story of Jesus. And we'll read in our book, and I don't want to, uh, what's it say? What did it say? Uh, what's the word? When you don't want to disclose the end of a movie. Yeah, that. <laughs> But there's a, a process that the Holy Spirit took Reese Howells through. He said, I want you to go and witness to this person every day. I want you to tell him about Jesus. And he did. And then God eventually saved him. He, I mean, I think the Holy Spirit even said he'd give him a date. And now he said, now this one over here is your next target. He said, but I don't ever want you to say anything to him. And I'm going to save him before the end of the year. He said, all I want you to do is cry out their name in prayer every night. The town drunk. Everyone said that person is never going to be saved. They're mad at God. They're drunk all the time. They're, they, you know, had terrible situation. They're never going to get saved. And said, and, and Reese said, what God? You want me not to say anything to them? That's what the Holy Spirit said to them. No, don't say anything to them. Just cry out to them, to me, for them. And the Holy Spirit showed him there's two ways to get people saved. We can talk to them. Or we can just pray for them. Now, I, 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 I know, I know a, a lot of them say, oh, good, we could just pray for them. But no, God said, I want you to be persistent and consistent in your prayer. I want you to put some heat on it. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? So Friday and Saturday, I was walking all over the city with these intercessors that have come from, several, half of them came up from, Dallas, and they, another half came from 
Harrisburg, and they are establishing a national or even an international prayer network. They have leaders to lead the prayer network in each state, and they're uh, the leader for the state of Pennsylvania says she's trying to get a prayer leader for every county in Pennsylvania to head up a, a, a council of prayer in their county. And she said, for some reason, I don't know why it is, uh, Harrisburg and West was very easy, but I've been having a very hard time finding someone who says they want to pray and they want to do uh, these covert missions of prayer uh, that God is asking us to do. And I don't know how, but somehow she got my name, called me, and she said, I'm appointing you to be over Philadelphia. I said, surely. Yeah. I've got eight older brothers who are bigger and stronger. I've just got these few sheep out here I should tend, and every once in a while, I'll go out and do some door dashing to my older brothers and Uber Eats. <laughs> So I, I went, went out with them in prayer assignments and it was a very powerful time. And, you know, I thought I knew who I was and, you know, you know they're saying that everyone's saying, you know, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. And I'm staying in my lane. But I saw they walked in a level of authority yeah. that I just knew every believer should walk in. Amen. Uh, some of us here in the house today you know, I'm saved, sanctified, got the Holy Ghost on the inside of me. And then they see someone talking to themselves, uh, not sure if they're crazy or demon-possessed, and they say, oh, we got to get out of here. <laughs> well, God has given you the ability to overcome both crazy and demon possession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it was amazing. They said, we want to get to the first, the root of the issue of the problem in these United States. They said, we're going all over the United States, and we're going to the root of the problem. We're tearing down the old altars and reestablishing the altars of our God, just like Elijah did on Mount Carmel. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And did you know the birthplace of the, the, the Masons was here in Philadelphia. The first meeting of the Mason, Masons were here in, was here in Philadelphia. And they have the Grand Lodge right strategically positioned uh, next to our city hall. And we went and prayed and made decrees. Because though our founding fathers were in large part men of God who memorized the Bible and the word of God is, is infused in all of the founding doctrines. There's also a thread of Masonic influence. Well, what's wrong with the Masons? They, you know, there's a church that we visit and celebrate here in Philadelphia. One of the stained glass windows celebrates the, to the Masons. Well, people, when they first get in it, it sounds and seems like the word of God. You know, I went to an Islamic funeral a couple years ago. Friend of mine's brother converted to Islam and to support her, I went to his funeral and you know I heard the Imam give his message and he came from the Gospel of John. It sounded very much like a Christian message. But then he started slipping a few little things in. Uh, I went and heard a Jehovah's Witness message and Wow, it sounded so good. Yeah. The people of God, who I knew were Christians and knew God and saved and loved the Lord, saying, Amen, yes, that's right, go ahead and preach. <laughs> then he slipped in a little lie. You know what? I get thirsty and I could drink a whole bottle of water and it would be good for me, but if I put just a little bit of poison in there, yeah. even though the the, the, the water, the good stuff, outweighs the poison by 99% to 1. Wow. That 1% one can still kill me. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. That 1% of a lie can separate you from God. That's what happened to Eve. Mm -hmm. yeah. so your, your eyes are going to come open. You're going to see good and evil. Stay close to God. Keep your ears toward heaven. 
listening to what God is saying. We went to several places, and I just was amazed how they, when they felt things or sensed things, they just spoke it out so confidently. I said, wow, God, I hear things and sense things all the time, but I always said, well, I kind of, sort of, maybe think. But, you know, they were bold in what they believed God to do. I don't, and I don't even know if they, they hit the nail on the head every single time. But I think about children growing up. You know, babies start to walk and they're wobbly feet. And sometimes they fall down. You know what? That doesn't stop them from getting back up. They get right back up again. No one has to tell them, you know. They, they want to try everything. Is this good to eat? Let me try it. And... and, and you know, they make mistakes. And you know what the parents do? When the little kid, little infant, gets up and starts walking and then falls down, oh, it's not cute. Come on, let me help you back up. They don't smite them. They don't put them up. You idiot, get out of my house falling down. What's the matter with you? And some of us think that's how our Father God is in heaven. I fell down, God, and God said, get out of my house. You're no longer my child. No, God said, oh, thank you so much for trying. Come on, let me help you up. Get back up again. Yeah, you missed it, but that's okay. Look, he's not condoning sin. God said, if these things, and he gives a list of things in 1 Peter, if these things be in you and abound, you shall never fall. The Jude says, uh, 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 now unto him that's able to keep us from falling and to present us with faultless, with exceeding joy. We don't have to fall, we can be joyous about it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Amen. So they were concerned about David. The brothers were concerned about David. And, uh, and I can just imagine what David was thinking. And I, I just found this uh, in passage in Isaiah 59 that David was quite possibly thinking. I know it was written after David's time, but I just want to read this to you in Isaiah 59, verses 16 through 21. And it reads, and he saw that there was no man who wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm was brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garment of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with the zeal as a cloak, according to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression to, in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. David said, I'm putting on salvation. Thank you, Sister Valerie, for your demonstration and the worship. Sometimes we just have to do prophetic acts. When we get up in the morning, just, you know, prophetically put on your breastplate of righteousness. Gird up your loins about with truth. Because, you know, sometimes people can push you into a place where, wow, the only way to get out is to lie. To get out, you know, not looking too bad. And we really don't want to look bad. So we have to, you know, I'm, I didn't really lie. I just sort of stretched the truth. Yeah, it really was black, but I called it light gray. So, <laughs> so we have to gird up our loins with truth. We have to keep uh, the helmet of salvation upon our head. We have to keep on the breastplate of righteousness. We have to keep our feet shod with the preparation of peace because everywhere we go, we want there to be peace. And I've been saying of late, I know there are books out by greater men and women than myself that say the battlefield is in, my, in your mind. But I'm saying to the people of God, to the mature saints, the battleground should never be in your mind. It should be outside. Inside your mind, you should always have the peace of the Lord. Inside your mind, you should always have the joy of the Lord. Yes, Joshua 1 8 says, he said, uh, uh, I'll, uh, we should have his word in our... Okay, stop. I got the message. Uh, 
We should have, we should always be speaking his word. We should always be meditating on his word night and day. And then he said we should walk in his word or walk in his way. If we're watching more news than we are reading the Bible or listening to the voice of God, then we are in danger of believing the lie over the truth. I don't care how many degrees Wolf Blitzer has or David Muir has. Stop eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was Adam and Eve's mistake. God says, I offer to you the tree of life. You can tap into my omnipotence, my omniscience, and my omnipresence anytime you want to, anytime you need to. So many, and so many of the things, the root causes of everything, it's not really a racial issue, though it seems like that's the picture they want to paint, but it's really a money thing. The root of the whole issue is a money thing. Don't you know Satan's job in heaven besides the divine covering, the, the cherubim that, that sing praise and worship to God day and night? You know what his other job in heaven was? If you read the word of God, it says he was the divine trader. He would trade for things. You're looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. You know how wealth is created in the nation? You know where the center of wealth for this nation is? The New York Stock Exchange up in New York. You heard of Wall Street? You know what Wall Street, why it was named Wall Street? Because it disrupted the commerce of the Indians who would trade and strengthen themselves with the other tribes. So they built a wall to divide them. And they said, this is where we're going to plant our center of commerce. And we're going to intercept the wealth of the tribes that come and try to connect and strengthen themselves. When, the, when William Penn came to uh, this area and he said, I want to make an example of the city of Philadelphia. Or, or I want to make it a place on earth as it is in heaven. He said, I know the king promised this territory to my father, but the king didn't talk to the Indians. And William Penn said, in order to do this thing right, I have to talk to them and negotiate with them and, and see and explain to them so that they understand that this now will be our land if we do X, Y, and Z. And it is, re it is said in history of every treaty the United States has ever made with the Indians, they've broken everyone except William Penn's treaty here in the city of Philadelphia. And the chief, when he came to William Penn, he handed him an arrow uh, in celebration of the treaty that they had signed. It wasn't William Penn, it was Benjamin Franklin. And then he took it back and he broke it in half and he gave it back to Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin said, what kind of gift is this, a broken arrow? Doesn't make sense. And then the Indian chief hands him 13 arrows representing the 13 colonies of the United States and says, here, now try and break those. And he couldn't. He said, if you stay together, you will remain unbroken. Don't let any newscaster, news reporter, newspaper tell you to separate or hate the white or to hate the wealthy or to hate the downtrodden or hate the gays or hate this or hate that, hate the Chinese, hate others. God says, if we stand united, if we remain united, we will stand. In Isaiah, uh, 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 Psalms 133 says, how beautiful, how blessed, how great it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's verse 1. But if you jump down to verse, I believe it's 3. I think there's only three verses. It says, there do I command the blessing. Some people say, oh, yes, yeah, in Mount Hermon. We have to go to Mount Hermon to be blessed with the Lord. No, it's in the unity that God commands the blessing. You want to be blessed, stay united despite how much they try to divide. I will not hate my brother and my sister. I will not hate men. I will not hate women. I will not hate gays. I will not like them, Sam I am. Wait, that's Dr. Seuss. Hallelujah. So I say, uh, 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 David was saying, I'm girding up myself with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He might not have said Jesus Christ, but he said, I'm regarding myself with the righteousness of God. I'm putting on my head the helmet of salvation. And you know what? Uh, might as well just give it all. Uh, so many have taught the helmet of salvation wrong. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians, he started out that chapter, chapter 6, he said, finally, my brethren, he was talking to the saved.
saved folks. He was talking to those who are already saved. He said, then he said, put on the whole armor of God. He starts naming other stuff. And number four or five, he gets down. Then put on the helmet of salvation. Wait a minute. I thought we were brethren. That meant we were saved. Why is the helmet of salvation number four or number five before all these other things? You're already saved. What does the helmet of salvation mean then? The helmet of salvation is to go on the highest point of your head so those that sit in darkness will see the great light and they'll come to the brightness of your rising. Yeah, they will see that you as a lighthouse and come to you for their salvation. Your helmet of salvation is not for you, but it is for those who don't know Jesus Christ that they will see the light in you and come to you. Here it says in Isaiah, he said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord God will lift up the standard. Who is the standard? You are the standard. You are the one that prevents the city from falling. You are the one that prevents the hellhounds from wreaking havoc in your neighborhood, in your family. You're the standard. And David said, I'm the standard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've got to seek God until you feel that authority come on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone said, my wife asked me, how do you get into the secret place? Hallelujah. I say, just go in and pray until you feel God. Don't go and stay until you, you and, and come out having done nothing. But every prayer God, is heard by God. But sometimes we'll go in and pray and we'll do our due diligence. We'll check off the check box. We, yep, we got, got that done. Next one clean all the sock drawer out and uh, you know, feed the dog and get some more yeah. toilet tissue because, yeah, COVID, that COVID, I don't know. You need <laughs> toilet tissue, like, I don't know what. Yo, <laughs> and water, yeah, we need water stacked up to the ceiling, yeah. But no, if we treat God like God, I'm coming to visit my friend. Lord, I don't even want to start out with all my laundry list of things that I want you to do. Lord, how's your day going? Lord, what do you have to say to me? What, what, what should I be doing? How should I be thinking? You know one prophet said to the other? He said, you're fine, but how am I? And that's how we should approach God. I know you'll get that later when you're driving home. Don't run off the road. But God is, we just come to God as our friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah all I've had today was a cup of coffee. Sorry, I'm high on hot uh, uh, caffeine. caffeine. Yeah, <laughs> well, we've got to land this plane. Anyway. <laughs> So we put on righteousness. We put on the garments of vengeance of clothing. We put on a righteous indignation and say, the devil has taken too much territory. We've got to win it back before Jesus comes. Yeah. You know, I used to live that way. If I died yesterday, that would be fine with me. I'd just go to be with heaven. And you know, to some extent, I'm like that today. Yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with going today. But I want to live until I see the victories that Jesus Christ deserves. He deserves greater than what we've won for him so far. He deserves so much more. The Apostle Paul said, I poured out myself. Wait, back up, Brother John. You said we got to stay in prayer until we feel God or we feel a breakthrough. Yeah, well, that might take oh, half an hour. <laughs> How many half-hour movies have you watched? Right, right. Amen. Amen. That might take a whole hour. But we've got to come to God and say, God, whatever it takes. I thank you that I'm not one of the ones in Afghanistan, so I'm going to stay here and I'm going to cry out to you for those in Afghanistan that have been left behind. I'm going to cry out for that persecuted church who's now being killed and maimed yeah. at the hands of the Taliban. I'm going to pray for the Taliban that God, you would save them and turn the situation around. Yes, right. thank you, Jesus. I'm going to call on with a, another group of mostly pastors and preachers, what have you, and at the end of the call, I, we were talking a little bit about the situation of in Afghanistan and what's going on in other countries and Haiti and, and Nigeria is going through a ethnic cleansing, trying to kill off the Christians and, and how Pakistan is tied into this whole Taliban uh, mess and they've been funding and keeping them alive. So there's just as much uh, craziness going on there. 
And everyone said, oh, yes, we've got to pray, we've got to pray. And I don't know why I said this. And I said, yeah, but we got to put our money where our mouth is. <laughs> if you really believe what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying you have to start an Afghanistan ministry, but so into someone who does. It's true, it's true. That's all God. I talked to the leaders. I <laughs> and then I, I said, oh, oh, God, I guess I now have to find <laughs> someone who's uh, doing something in Afghanistan. I turn on the TV and this person said they need $20 million in two days. They've got the airplanes all ready, but that's what we, they need to get 5,000 Christians, the underground church in Afghanistan. They need to get them out, but that's what they need. Jesus. And I look, heard the Lord say a certain amount, several hundred dollars. I said, okay, God, uh, yeah, I'll write a check from the church and we'll support this ministry and uh, I'll, you know, I'll take it up with the trustees and whoever later on. I'll take the blame. And so I get out of the car and I go to the website decline. Check the bank account. We got the money in there. What's wrong? I lessen the amount. Decline. Lessen it some more. Decline. God, what's going on? I said, no, I told you to give those several hundred dollars. Wow. wow. <laughs> 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 and I looked at the upcoming bills. I said, God, are you sure that's more than I make in my two and a half weeks? Uh, I can give a tithe. I can pay now and get back to you a little later. <laughs> but I know there's a blessing and pressing, and I immediately remembered uh, during one of P. Todd's conferences, uh, just before, it was February 20, was it 2020? Just before the whole COVID outbreak, we're sitting in the conference and they were taking the offering and I heard the Lord say, uh, give $600. And I said, and Teresa looking at me, we should give. We were planning already to give like, I think $50. Or and she said, oh, we need to give more than this. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> And so I said, well, okay, let's make it a gift from the Philadelphia Deliverance Tabernacle. You know, I got a release. That was great. Gave the, the money and, and, and we went home rejoicing, not th think, thinking anything wrong, feeling bad at all. Then the first week in March of 2020, someone who had been doing some work here in the church Gives me a call, says, John, I want to talk to you right away. We're talking now. He said, no, I want to come where you are. Are you at the church or are you at home? I said, I'm at home. Well, where do you live? Well, I don't really want to give him my address. <laughs> okay, give him my address. Are you there now? Are you going to be there for the next 10 minutes? Because it's taking about 10 minutes. Yeah, I'll be here. I, I've got to go out. So, as the night I was going out to speak somewhere, I said, but I'll be gone in about an hour or so. He said, all right, I just, I won't talk long. I just want just something real quick. And he, you know, comes, does some small talk, and he hands me this little envelope. I just want to make a blessing to the church. And he's, you know, talking about the weather and how things. And I'm like, what? You, you, this could have waited until Sunday. <laughs> and so he, you know, he drives off, not making a big deal. And I just threw it on the counter because I'm, getting ready to go, trying to get my things together. And I look, happened to look at it again. I said, let me just open it up. A check for $10,000 to the Philadelphia Deliverance Fund. Which came the week before the shutdown, the COVID shutdown, which enabled us to, be, to see our way through financially without going into debt at all through the whole COVID season. So I said, okay, God, all right. Wife needs a new car. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. Tell me what's in that. Where's my last paper? And, you know, I don't know why, so I put in my 
information online, and it went through faster than fast. I couldn't even get the last number typed in. Zoom, money out the bank, boom. <laughs> now I can say I, I write those checks with a whole lot of zeros. Now God, I just need a number to put in Yo. front because I got the zeros now. I just need a number to put in front. But not, you know, I'm getting way off. But anyway, anyway. In order for Jesus to return, the saints must possess the kingdom. And it's going to be the mature saints. The restitution of all things, not just restoration. We get to a place better than before Adam's fall. A lot of people are teaching and preaching that we're going to become like Adam before he sinned. But 2 Chronicles... Uh, no, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I quote it all the time. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things are become new. And you know I like to look up words, and that word new creature is kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, which means a creature that has never existed before. Now, you can get a new car, which is better than the old car. But God is saying, what I'm making you into is something that has never existed before Jesus Christ came, died, and was resurrected. You're not going to be like the old Adam before sin. You're going to be better than that. And, and the Bible is saying that, that we are now the sons of God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, when we get the revelation of who Jesus really is, and that we are just like him, we're going to be just like him. We're going to multiply food. We're going to walk on water. We're going to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. We're going to do what needs to be done. And we, the people of God, are going to do the fear and the dread of all nations. Yes. Hallelujah. So many people treat the church like a cruise ship. Have anyone been on a cruise, cruise ship? And so I did a little reading about cruise ship. It says cruise ships take as many as 6,000 Passengers, vacationers, but they have a crew of about a thousand, a little over a thousand to service. So most of the people on the ship are just waiting for someone else to wait on them. Come, come stroll over with me and refresh my uh, whatever it is, my little drink with the umbrella and cherry town. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how people see the church. I come to be served by those that the church, they're either paying money to or they're, they're related to somebody or they just love uh, doing that kind of thing. That's their, just their thing. I just come uh, to be blessed. But God has said in this day and age, we've got to think of the church as a battleship. And battleships can have as many as uh, 2,500 sailors on it. But every single one of them has a job to do. Yeah. Every single one, doesn't matter how many are on the ship, every one of them has a job. I don't care if it's just wiping out the, the torpedo tubes after they fired, but they have a job to do. There's someone who navigates, someone who operates a radar, someone who fires the gun, someone who fires the missile, someone who takes, maintains the engine, someone who cooks the food for all the people, someone who cleans the bathroom. Everyone has a job and everyone contributes and everyone is blessed. And I told this group of uh, people uh, yesterday as they were leaving, we were separating. Uh, yeah, it was a long uh, eight-hour day on Friday and 12-hour day yesterday, walking all over Philadelphia, binding and loosing, loosing and binding. And then a double rainbow breaks out. It was amazing. Anyway, and I, I'm telling them, I'm just so grateful that you've come to the city. I'm just sorry that I am the only one who's representing Philadelphia. That I feel like there should be someone mightier than me standing here, or at least somebody else from Philadelphia. Nobody else is from Philadelphia. Blessing the city. They said, no, because if we get Philadelphia right, the nation will be right. The nation was born here, so it's got to be reborn here. He said the, 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 the birthing was, was labored and because the baby was in breech birth and we're just like the midwives have come in who, who turned the baby so that we can birth this mighty revival yeah. into the nation. Yeah. And the effects will ripple throughout our nation from sea to shining sea. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, I'm all over my time. But thank God. Thank you. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason why you should pray to God until you feel something break in the atmosphere? Is there not a reason that you should listen and say, God, what is the strategic plan for me today? David didn't go through all the formalities, all the traditions, and all the customs. 
but he had that righteous indignation rise up on the inside. He said, I defeated a bear, and I defeated a lion. I don't need the, the at, uh, uh, equipment, the attributes of man. He said, I've got my sling. But most importantly, I've got my God. And, 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 and Goliath was insulted by such a puny little guy. What am I, a dog that someone comes running at me with sticks and stones? What? A, well, this is an insult. And it says, you know, as David was standing there uh, throwing out these insults to David, David ran to the giant. The giant didn't come running to David. David was so full of the authority and the confidence of his God that he ran to the giant and he said, he said what he was going to do without even saying his name. He said, I wouldn't even recognize who you are. I'm not even going to say your name. I'm not talking about how big you are, how your weapons look like, and how heavy they are. All I'm saying is, you, you, to me, you look like bird food. I'm going to sever your head from your shoulders and your carcass will be full to the birds. He said, how dare you defy the Lord our God? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And I know he wasn't talking about any urological issues. But he was talking about someone who did not have covenant with God. Those that do not have a covenant with the God Almighty should not have rule and reign over you. That's what the miracle was all founded about, that the authority of the government does not come from yeah. some uh, invisible being, but they come from we the people. And we the people are endowed by our creator with unalienable rights, and we decide who governs over us. That's what Joel chapter 2 says. He said, the priest and the minister must cry out between the altar and the door that the heathen not reign over us. Why are the heathen reigning over us? Because we're not crying out to God between the altar and the door. It's time for us to get down on our knees or lay down or whatever. Whatever we've got to do is to cry out to God. He said, I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal the land. Yes. This is the hour of deliverance because deliverance is taking the land. And if you don't know the God that I know, it's time that you know him. All you have to do is say, God, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Wash away all of my sins. But don't end your prayer there. Say, Holy Spirit, come in. Fill me. Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. With the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I always say, I don't understand all everything and I don't know how that works. But the Bible says, he that speaking in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He builds himself up. He strengthens him. We don't want to be like those who get saved today, lost tomorrow, saved the next day. We don't want to be on that roller coaster ride. But what we want to do, we want to get saved and keep going up from glory to glory to glory to glory. So get filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Yeah. And man, you'll be on your, on your way to being a fire blazer, a trail blazer for the kingdom of God. God bless you. We love you. Until the next time, shalom.